So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to UCL. My name is Uta Steiger. I direct the European Institute here at UCL, and it is my great pleasure to be welcoming you here in the UCL Faculty of Laws um, for tonight's event. Under normal circumstances, um, one would have assumed that just under two months before Brexit Day, there might have been a slight fatigue setting in. <laughs> But these aren't quite ordinary circumstances, of course, and we have a very extraordinary speaker with us tonight, so I'm not surprised so many of you have turned out to hear him speak. I'm delighted that uh, Sir Ivan Rogers has taken time out of his schedule to talk to us about where Brexit came from and where it is likely to take us. And I'm also very grateful for uh, UCL's president and provost, uh, Michael Arthur, to uh, be chairing tonight's uh, discussion. Before I hand over um, to the two, um, just a few housekeeping uh, things, if I may. First of all, you will have seen um, there is a Wi-Fi here and a, a, a hashtag as well to go with it, so you're welcome um, to tweet. Otherwise, might I please ask you to remember to put your uh, phones in silent. You uh, will otherwise be showing up on um, a live stream and film. And, um, also, with regards to the fire exit, I've been asked to say that this would be the fire exit door. You have to go up the stairs, around the corner, and across the street, should that occasion arise. Um, other than that, just to say, um, uh, Sir Ivan will be speaking for about an hour, and then we will have half an hour's time uh, for question. And so with that, without further ado, over to Michael. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Michael Arthur, and I have the great honour of being the President and the Provost of UCL. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, and our guest speaker, Sir Ivan Rogers, uh, to this um, uh, event tonight. Um, by way of introduction, um, Sir Ivan uh, was uh, educated at Balliol College at the University of Oxford. I guess we'll have to forgive him that. Um, and uh, also at the École uh, Normale Superior before going back to Balliol for three years. And then he um, uh, applied for a place on the civil service fast track and chose at that time the Department of Health and Social Security. Um, in 92, he was seconded to uh, the Treasury, uh, didn't return to his former department. He served in the Treasury, including time as private secretary to Kenneth Clark, then chancellor of the uh, Exchequer. Uh, he was then seconded to the European Commission as chief of staff to Sir Leon Britton, uh, returning uh, to be director of European strategy and policy and later director of budget and public finances under Gordon Brown. Uh, in 2003, Sir Ivan was chosen to succeed uh, Jeremy Haywood as the Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister, Tony Blair. And after three years uh, in this role, Sir Ivan left the civil service for a while um, and uh, he became head of the UK public sector group at Citigroup um, and uh, then transferred to be head of the public sector industry group UK and Ireland at Barclays Capital from 2010 to 2011. Uh, in 2012, Sir Ivan returned to the civil service as the Prime Minister's advisor for Europe and global issues, and then uh, became head of European and Global Issues Secretariat based in the uh, Prime Minister's office at number 10. Uh, he then, of course, went on uh, to uh, the role uh, which I think makes him uniquely qualified to uh, give this evening's uh, lecture, uh, and that, of course, was a role as a senior British civil servant um, who was permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the European Union uh, from 4th of November 2013 until his resignation uh, on the 3rd of January 2017. Um, Sir Ivan, you are very welcome at UCL. We are very grateful to you for giving us your time and for coming along. Uh, to give this lecture this evening, which we have been looking to, forward to uh, absolutely massively. Where did Brexit come from and where is it going to take the UK? Those are two really good questions, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for those very kind words of invit invitation and welcome. Um, uh, as you'll detect from that uh, account of my CV, virtually everything I have uh, gone to and touched has, uh, in the end, gone badly. So, um, <laughs> so I don't know what you can deduce from that. Of course, my line to take is that it would have been even worse without me. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure how convincing that is on the question of Brexit. As you say, you, you asked me to talk for about an hour on where Brexit came from and where it may take us. I'll try and cover both, although it would take much longer than an hour. And... Uh, and answer questions later, but given the intense political crisis we're now in, I wanted to focus primarily on where we now are, why we're there, and then look again at what our real options are. We desperately need clear, honest thinking about our choices, not just in the weeks ahead, but years and decades ahead, and I'm afraid I continue to think that our political debate is bedeviled by what, at the time I resigned, I term muddled thinking and by fantasies and delusions about what our options really are in the world as it is, as opposed to the different worlds people on different sides of the debate would prefer to inhabit. To be clear at the outset, I do think these fantasies, which one would have hoped might be dissipating by now in the face of reality, are still being propagated on all sides. The denialism, I think, is pretty universal. But if we're to take good decisions about our future, it's now genuinely urgent we get beyond the myth-making. I'm not going to speculate pointlessly here tonight about the votes next week, but I do want to set out why we've reached an impasse, why I believe the risks, I'm afraid, are appreciably higher than either the markets or the commentary I believe. Uh, so let me begin to answer that question of why are we at a severe moment of political, constitutional, and then potentially economic crisis. Let me first remind you of an old friend of all negotiators, the so-called ZOPA. Any negotiation has, in negotiators' jargon, a ZOPA, a zone of possible agreement, which is defined by where the interests, incentives, and bottom lines of the sides can intersect. From the Prime Minister's point of view, the deal struck on November the 25th with the EU is in the ZOPA. Indeed, it's the only deal acceptable to her which could be. And it was indeed in the ZOPA for the EU as well. It's a good deal for them which I'll come back to, which meant it was not at all hard to line up Michel Barnier and the heads of state and government to say it was the only deal they would do. The Prime Minister, as I say, decided that her best course was to reach the ZOPA with the EU, which was consistent with her red lines, though we should bear in mind she's revised her red lines during the negotiation. I'll come back to that. And then basically seek to drag her party and or a majority of the Commons to the realisation that she'd done the only deal that could be done and thus reached the only ZOPA that actually existed. And by this means, to convince her party and a Commons majority that the choice, it's my way or the abyss, was real and not contrived. That's our old friend, the TINA strategy. TINA, of course, standing for there is no alternative. Uh, now, the abyss was different, of course, depending on whom she was addressing. To her own right wing, it was the abyss of the cancellation or reversal of Brexit, as advocated by many on the left. So to them, it was, I'm delivering hard Brexit, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, resuming national control over laws, borders, and money. To the moderate Labour MPs whom she wanted, still wants, to detach from their leadership, it was the abyss of the hardest possible no-deal Brexit, as advocated by the right. So to them, it was, I'm delivering a compromise Brexit, which involves long-term commitments to align UK rules with EU ones in the most sensitive sectors for many of your constituents. The message to both extremes in the debate was, is, you risk ending up with your worst nightmare world if you push your first preference all the way. You must accept my compromise. It's the only compromise which, she says to the Brexiteers, delivers Brexit over the line and renders it irreversible, except by a fresh accession process to the European Union, even if it's not the Brexit you want. And to the Remainers, she says, it avoids a disorderly no-deal Brexit and delivers a softer Brexit than many in my party want. Now, if that's your strategy, and it is her strategy, you, of course, refuse, and she does refuse, to take no deal off the table, as having it on the table has been completely central all along to attempting to force do through the deal you want. But let's be honest. The other party in this negotiation, the EU, has never for one minute believed that the UK would go through with no deal. 
as it's self-evidently a lot worse in economic terms for the UK than the deal, and a lot worse for the UK than it is for the EU. They can see just about that we might do it by accident or indecision or incompetence, but why would you do it on purpose? The EU side has, however, in my view, persistently under underestimated the accident risk, and it's insufficiently understood that from the outset, that for reasons I explain later, a lurch out to a WTO-only world, which both leaders and technocrats think is an obviously wholly irrational course, could be attractive to a sizable chunk of the governing party. It's never been a credible threat to, you, to EU eyes because the consequences are obviously so damaging to a government that inflicts the no-deal outcome on the country when an alternative negotiated outcome is available. They're relaxed that no government could con contemplate doing it and then wouldn't survive. Nothing in the last two and a half years has shaken that mindset. Indeed, much has reinforced it. So constant repetition, we've had it again this weekend from past and current cabinet ministers of the proposition that keeping no deal on the table is our strongest card with the EU is and always has been discounted as total nonsense. Why would a government which was seriously prepared to go for no deal be pressing them so strongly from late 2017 onwards for what is clearly a deeply unappealing status quo without voice transition for two years, unless it knew that no deal is, in the recent words of both the Foreign Secretary and the Business Secretary, cataclysmic and disastrous. Now, in my experience, if the other side's threats in a negotiation make no sense and contradict all the evidence that you have in front of their eyes as to what they're doing, you just ignore them. And indeed, no one who was genuinely contemplating a no-deal outcome in 2016, whilst of course having assured the public it would never come to that, would have wanted to trigger Article 50 in the way and at the time that we did. They should have wanted to be sure that we would, by the end of any two-year Article 50 process, be as ready as we ever could be to jump without a deal. Now, of course, they are far from the only ones who appear to have been completely taken by surprise as to what the Article 50 process covered and what it does not I'll come back to that later. Now, domestically, if you're pursuing the Prime Minister's strategy, you would, of course, talk up the credibility of no deal in order to concentrate minds that it might be a genuine policy option to try and force people towards your deal in preference, despite knowing, really, that it's a grossly irresponsible choice for which neither private nor public sector is ready. The private sector is not ready. I talk to the private sector all the time, I might add. They're not ready, after all, primarily because you yourselves in government have consistently told them that there will be a transition it, that they can completely rely on, and so companies don't need to take precipitate action. Because you're desperate, they do not act as you know they would if there, would be no, if there was no deal, as that would hit the economy and the public finances. Begging the private sector, which ministers have been doing, not to activate contingency plans for no deal because you will not allow it to happen, but then allowing it to happen would be an extraordinary act of folly and self-harm by a government whose reputation with investors would never recover and wouldn't deserve to. The problem at political level, though, is that it's simply not a sufficiently convincing threat for any camp to shift their position. Time might still make it so in the next two months if the Prime Minister could metaphorically take the ball to the corner flag and run down the clock. But the widespread belief in the House of Commons that that's her intention, aside from profoundly annoying the private sector, which has no reliable basis on which to plan and therefore increasingly has to assume the worst because it now gets no reassurance that there's a plan to avoid the worst, that merely persuades parliamentarians that they must take the ball off her. Those who don't want no deal think it's so self-evidently self-harming on a grand scale that no responsible government will do it. They think they easily have the numbers in the House of Commons to stop it happening anyway. They think the more that no deal hoves into public view, the greater their chance of persuading the public that Brexit's going badly wrong and may prove a disaster. Those who do like the idea of no deal are delighted if, no, if serious no deal contingency plans are visibly commenced because they think that helps their prospects of selling to the public the proposition that no deal is perfectly viable, it won't be so bad, it can be managed, and at least it's proper Brexit, unlike the dog's breakfast that is the Prime Minister's deal. So they want to capitalise on the public appetite, really, for the whole charade of the last two and a half years, simply to end. So neither side has really reacted in the last two months in the way the Prime Minister hoped and presumably expected and calculated. They've just dug in. And it's as if those reactions 
on both wings of the debate were not bad enough. Those in the centre, who are neither hard Brexiteers nor reversers, also don't accept the Prime Minister's it's my way or the abyss argument. They think they have much superior, softer Brexit compromise options to hers to offer, and they therefore don't accept that her Zopa is the best, let alone the only one. And they think that their options for the future relationship have a better chance than the Prime Minister's now of commanding a majority in the Commons when it comes to the next or final meaningful vote. Now, of course, it's in the interest of the Prime Minister, but also of the right wing of the Tory party who advocate no deal, managed or not, and of the People's Vote lobby, to demonstrate that all middle way options don't work and to hope that time plays in their favour in the next few weeks. And there's therefore nothing really more vicious in UK politics right now, and that's quite a high bar, than the attack uh, by the People's Vote supporters on the proposed Norway Plus option, or the assaults by the European Research Group on the right of anyone on, the, anyone on their party who might countenance supporting a permanent customs union. We've reached the point in what I've previously described as a Brexit revolution, which I think this is, when it's essential for both the revolutionaries and the counter-revolutionaries to extirpate any compromises. Now, that's a pretty common feature, I think, of revolutionary politics. It's just that the UK is not very used to revolutionary politics, in which polarisation progressively narrows the space for compromise, and indeed compromise, which is always a fairly dirty word in UK politics, becomes a term of abuse. The revolutionaries declare that every version of Brexit bar their own is not truly Brexit. And the people's voters declare every soft Brexit version, playing on variants of either a customs union or a common market without the political integration, is an unacceptable compromise, and that only reversal of the referendum result will do. On the Brexiteer side, we're left with the bizarre spectacle, and it is a bizarre spectacle, of Brexiteers, many of whom used to argue that exiting to Norwegian or Swiss-style destinations would be a vast improvement on remaining in the EU because these were vibrant parliamentary democracies whose peoples had bravely spurned European political integration in favour of free trading relationships from outside, you now have these people arguing that if the UK now escaped only to such a destination, it would be a terrible betrayal. It would be Brexit in name only, as bad or as worse than the Prime Minister's lousy deal, a triumph for the deep state that had been wanting to sabotage Brexit from the outset. Now, whatever one thinks of the Norwegian Swiss models, and I've got huge problems with both of them in terms of a destination for the UK, to characterise Norway and Switzerland as countries which, despite their sovereign votes not to join the EU, in some way failed to make good a genuine escape from European political integration is patently absurd. One can't possibly argue that Norwegian or Swiss-type models are not Brexit at all, unless one is also arguing that the integrationist ratchet which the Eurosceptics believed was pulling us in to where we didn't want to go, a perfectly arguable case, incidentally, unless that applies equally to Norway and Switzerland. But that view is absurd. And this bombardment of propaganda from those saying that anything other than a so-called clean break Brexit is not really Brexit comes from the very people who, before and immediately after the referendum, promised the voting public that a preferential trade deal with the EU was in the back. This was always piffle, uh, to use no more impolite a term. Um, but it does reveal an underlying and important truth in this debate, which always worried me when I looked well before the referendum and straight after it at how best we could get on and deliver Brexit if the public voted for it, which I always thought was rather likely. Eurosceptics, despite the narcissism of small differences, could always hold together when we were in the EU because they didn't have to define a post-Brexit destination or, crucially, an exit route and method. They could unify around the need to escape the integrationist maw of the EU and decide that they could cross the bridge of what to do next in the unlikely event that they ever succeeded in getting an in-out referendum. People, some very senior names in the Cabinet, some former very senior members of the Cabinet, who are now fervently on the so-called clean break Brexit, were, within the last three to four years, to be heard proposing continuing with single market and customs union membership after, after we left, or arguing, as I've said, for Norway-style European economic area options. Plenty said so to me personally when I was Sherpa and permanent representative. Their real beef, after all, was political union, monetary union, potential fiscal union, 
with European citizenship and its implications, and with the sense that issues progressively got sucked away from, the cap from national level to supranational level and never came back. Even Nigel Farage can be heard in 2015 TV interviews toying with a European economic area type destination. He now completely anathematizes as a total betrayal of the purpose of Brexit. This is, as I say, what happens in revolutionary moments. The Institute of Economic Affairs indeed offered a large prize once David Cameron's Bloomberg speech had dangled the realistic prospect of an in-out referendum to help define an agreed destination and exit path because the IEA could see the looming crisis over what on earth Brexiteers could ever coalesce around, both as the destination and as the path to reach it. The most thoughtful sceptic attempts to map an exit route, embodied, I think, in a rather lengthy tome called Flexit, which is at least a genuine serious attempt to grapple with what insider experts like me knew were inordinately complex issues. This was spurned by mainstream Brexiteers, despite some brief dabbling by the likes of Owen Patterson. Why? I'm afraid the answer to that is quite simple, because as soon as you have to define what you do, really do post want post-Brexit, as opposed to what you really don't want, as soon as you have to map out a genuinely viable, very complex path to exiting an organisation you've been part of for 45 years, and which has inserted itself in every domain of UK life, which is exactly what you hate about it, the unity on the Eurosceptic side completely fragments and small differences about where we actually want to go become large ones. Dominic Cummings, better known these days obviously as Benedict Cumberbatch, um, <laughs> when chairing Vote Leave, shrewdly, deliberately avoided proposing any plan and focused the entire campaign on what it didn't want and ensuring that that resonated with the maximum number of voters who might find Brexit appealing but would have radically different ideas of what it would deliver for them. The last thing he or the political leaders of the Leave campaign wished to do was to set out a proposed destination and a route map to reach it. That would have completely torn the fragile coalition apart. And it would have exposed the desirability of the destination in comparison to the status quo, with which much of the public had had very good reasons to feel unhappy, to close scrutiny. And that's why now, again, with the road running out and time running out and under the pressure of simply having now to specify where one wants to end and how to get there, the option of WTO only, which all serious leave thinkers and politicians had themselves disparaged before the referendum, has now emerged in various guises as the preferred option of the hard Brexiteers. As one astute commentator who voted leave, incidentally, put it rather superbly this weekend, this is the I have no solutions and can't be asked to think option. In all honesty, it's a gross dereliction of responsibility and a huge failure of leadership under cover of increasingly empty demagogic rhetoric about betrayal. Now, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose, as the saying goes, and the campaigners on both sides, because I'm afraid this now applies to the Remain lobby too, still vastly prefer to carry on campaigning in poetry than having to govern in prose. The Brexiteers again avoid having to say anything serious or precise about what their destination means and how it works. They just assert loudly, it's freedom. And it's not some ghastly, toxic, sordid compromise that the Prime Minister has made with 27 other countries negotiating realities. The adjectives now flow freely in the newspaper columns and the indignation about the nation's humiliation is notched up a level every passing week. But as to solutions... They advance as better than the horror they think the Prime Minister's proposal uh, is. We only get vacuous proposals. We hear that all links with the past could and should be severed in one go, and that we'll be free from horrible entanglements. And thus, of course, from having to acknowledge that there are very difficult trade-offs, and life after Brexit will be bedeviled with one long, difficult negotiation after another with our nearest neighbours and biggest trading partners, and that those negotiations will force very hard choices on us as they force those choices on the Swiss, for example. But to jump to WTO-only freedom, of course, makes no sense, particularly from people who say we must leave the EU in order to pursue our sovereign free trade deals with other trade blocs or countries, which indicates that trading either on WTO terms or only via those preferential trade deals struck by the EU when we were in it, as we do now, is no use and is holding us back. But if the supposed route 
to prosperity for post-Brexit global Britain lies through a global latticework of preferential trade deals. You can make that argument. I don't, I don't buy it, but it's a route to, uh, to uh, some further growth. How can one possibly seriously argue that the only block with which one doesn't need a free trade deal is the one with whom we do easily the largest volume of trade? And if a preferential trade deal with the EU is in practice essential, and it is, then you obviously gain nothing by tumbling out completely to WTO rules and then having to try and scramble your way back up the hill to a preferential deal under huge time pressure, notably in those many sectors and issues on which a resort to WTO rules gives you nothing anyway. You just hand the perfect negotiating hand to the other side. So let me repeat that just in case you're wondering whether this can possibly be right or whether I'm spoofing you. We're now being flogged the proposition by senior ministers and ex-senior ministers that in order to move from a deep preferential agreement, the supranational political juridical enforcement aspects of which you deplore, but which gives you much the better trading terms with the bloc, above all in sectors in which you're very competitive, in order to move from that to a less deep but normal EU preferential trade agreement, which gives you substantially better access than WTO terms, the best route is to go all the way out to WTO terms first. Because, and why? Because that is going to go, apparently going to give you the whip hand in negotiations with a block for which the absence of any preferential deal covers a vastly lower proportion of its trade than it does of yours. And the block, nevertheless, is going to come begging you for a new preferential deal, drop completely its demand for the backstop, accept that technological and administrative solutions to the Irish border suffice when they have previously repeatedly made clear that they don't, and settle for much less British money than the UK Prime Minister has already agreed to pay if she got an acceptable withdrawal agreement, which she now publicly agrees she has. I mean, this stuff would make snake oil salesmen blush. <laughs> the reality is that you would, in exiting to WTO terms, reset the baseline for future free trade agreement talks in the worst possible place for UK negotiators. Whatever you think of the Prime Minister's proposed outcome, one can see that the whole purpose of the all-UK backstop, aside from escaping her impossible but self-imposed predicament on a Northern Ireland-specific backstop, is precisely to avoid that, at least on goods. I'll come back to that. And she wants to start from a baseline on goods of the status quo and negotiate on how far, if at all, liberalisation needs to be wound back from its current deep level because we're leaving the legislation, adjudication and enforcement machinery of the bloc. Now, on services... As I say, the Prime Minister, because of her free movement, absolute red line, is reconciled to starting from a tabula rasa and from WTO terms. Indeed, the political declaration text is explicit on the point. Both sides will begin with their WTO commitments, and the EU side with its commitments in existing FTAs and work up from that baseline. The political declaration accompanying the withdrawal agreement cites Article 5 of the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, which just sets out the basic requirements for two WTO members trading solely on WTO terms which seek to embark on free trade agreement negotiations. Now, as I say, this is entirely thanks to UK red lines, but it's about as unambitious as it can get. There's a sizable gap between WTO commitments and the services regimes which e the EU applies to third countries, and the EU free trade agreements essentially concentrate on closing that gap rather than seeking to get anywhere close to extending the level of services trade liberalisation which you get when you're in the single market. So again, let's be clear exactly what we're doing here because nobody is telling you exactly what we're doing here. Thanks to our own choices and red lines, we're starting from the most an unambitious tabula rasa baseline possible on the sectors of the economy in which we run a huge trade surplus with the EU but we're seeking on key goods sectors in which we want run a massive trade deficit with the EU to start from the baseline of membership and with the objective on, of building and improving on the so-called single customs territory whilst somehow simultaneously developing a fully independent trade policy. So if you look at that in the round, it's not too surprising that the EU side thinks this is a very decent basis for itself for the next round of discussions and is prepared to stretch its principles to deliver an all-UK backstop, which one has to presume the Prime Minister told them was the key to unlocking a deal, 
even though, actually, if you're them, this marks a bit of a splitting of the so-called four freedoms, the indivisible four freedoms, two by two. Why are they prepared to do it? Because it's heading for an asymmetrical trade deal in their favour. As for Westminster, though, we're deep in Alice in Wonderland, I'm afraid, where the vast bulk of our peculiarly antiquated debate about our trading future has been focused on goods and tariff issues, where tariffs outside the world of agriculture, where they remain very steep, are actually very low, with very few exceptions, as they are in the US and other major players, where services <coughs> represent 80% of the UK economy, and tradable services, tradable cross-border services, are much the fastest growing element of our trade, and where barriers to trade in services are all about regulation and regulatory art architecture. Now, to be clear, the Canada deal that people talk about is actually a good free trade agreement by world standards. But it doesn't deliver the Canadians a uniform position in the EU market or vice versa. The general provisions it has on services, liberalisation, are counteracted by more than 500 sectoral or regional exemptions, often relating to corporate form, to the necessary qualifications of the service providers, or to discrimination on grounds of nationality, none of which is legal internally in the EU but all of which can and will be applied to UK service providers when we leave the EU. All of which is perfectly legal under WTO rules. Whatever those people who witter on endlessly about the marvels of WTO terms tell you, because they don't understand or they don't wish to the difference between those terms and single market terms. It cannot be repeated often enough, and I certainly intend to carry on repeating it for one, because we're about to find out the hard way in trade negotiations that leaving the single market makes trade, notably in services in which we are world class, less free, much less free, because we're closing off ways in which our world class firms can provide services seamlessly across borders. What's dismal, I'm afraid, about our political debate at the moment is the inability to start that debate and even recognise those facts until that trade negotiation is upon us. So let's revert to goods. The Prime Minister wants to build on and improve the single customs territory and deliver deep and lasting regulatory alignment on a common rule book, more properly known as the EU rule book, but never mind, uh, while simultaneously delivering a fully sovereign trade policy across both goods and services. Now, how one pulls off this amazing three-card trick is understandably uh, not fleshed out in the political declaration because the internal contradictions as soon as you do try to do so would be painfully obvious. If we aspire to have friction-free trade, which the Prime Minister is obsessed with saying it's got to be friction-free, and regulated goods sectors need friction-free trade, delivering minimal checks on cross-border trade, we obviously pursue the maximum possible regulatory alignment in the jargon, which, whilst not removing the need for all border checks, will limit their scale, and we will also take on so-called level playing field commitments in the jargon of Brussels, to guarantee the other side that this alignment will persist and that we won't engage in regulatory arbitrage when we're out of the European Union and go Singaporean. But that entails a major political sacrifice because that drives a coach and horses through the taking back control agenda on goods trade and regulation. Prime ministerial euphemisms, and I'm afraid the Prime Minister is quite good at euphemisms, uh, like a common rule book, can't conceal that to retain market access and minimise frictions in goods trade, and hence to prevent the relocation of major businesses from the UK into the EU, we are in practice going to have to bind ourselves voluntarily to align on the EU's law book and implement masses of rules and norms we shall have had no part in setting. Now that infuriates the sovereigntists to the Prime Minister's right, because it manifestly will trammel the UK's trade policy on goods and it will limit the free trade agreements the UK can ever pursue to partners whose regulatory orders are not fundamentally at odds with the European Union. Well, welcome to the world. Sovereignty in these domains, as in data flows and other services and procurement, is not unadulterated. Even if you're a sizable player, which we are, but we're not a global rule setter. And for those agen whose agenda is essentially both sovereigntist and geostrategic, this withdrawal agreement points in a direction they view as anathema. Because as they see it, it's driven by business interests which are beholden to a model of business predicated on a close economic relationship with the EU. 
well, fuck business, as someone once said, someone very blonde once said. Um, to avoid having to debate the reality of what this stance means for the UK economy and for our fiscal position, we get two rhetorical devices. In both, in my view, the bluster fails to conceal the absence of substance. First, we get the, we've got to go global and not parochial little Europe routine. Sure, increasing our trade with fast-growing parts of the planet should, of course, be a major UK goal, and that will, over time, further shift patterns of UK trade. But that shift is happening. It's actually happening faster for global Germany and global France, as indeed everywhere else in the EU and everywhere else in the developed world, which is why German trade flows with China earlier this decade for the first time surpassed German trade flows with France, when 20 years previously they barely registered on the same scale. The idea that it's impossible to have global, Atlantic, Asian or African vocation from within the EU is just crass. The case for strengthening trade ties beyond the EU also in no way makes the argument that deeper trade liberalisation within the EU and deeper liberalisation, notably on services, in which cross-border liberalisation of trade is much more difficult to achieve than on tariffs. And it's always easier within a bloc than it is with the markets outside. In no way does it make the case that that agenda should be abandoned. Nor is it true, although constantly repeated by ministers and ex-ministers, that geography no longer matters on services trade. Look at the data. Our reality is that UK services exports into the EU in the year of the referendum amounted, amounted to about 90 billion sterling. That's as much as our exports to the next eight biggest export markets put together. It's just fatuous to suggest that when you immediately substantially worsen your terms of trade in services with massively your largest market, instant trade deals with other fast-growing regions will on services substitute for that loss. I've not met a single senior executive in a major services firm in any service sector in the UK who believes this. And understandably. The loss is immediate, sizable, and certain, because one's legal position changes overnight the moment you've left the EU. The potential gain from other trade deals is speculative and in the middle distance. And on that, the evidence before company CEOs and chairs' eyes is clear. The UK government is struggling, as it was always going to, even to stand still in the short term with third countries with whom, via EU membership, we have trade deals out of which we inevitably slip when we leave. That's incidentally not a criticism of those doing formidable hard work in Whitehall. There's an immense volume of technical work even to aim to stand still, not to roll backwards in the next few years. Second rhetorical device from the Brexiteers, you attempt to de-risk no deal to the public by claiming it's not really an alarming no deal, but a liberatory managed no deal, a no deal set of mini deals, a multi-deal. Uh, the new euphemisms keep on coming virtually every day now. With one ban, this enables you to avoid the backstop, avoid paying over the money, or at least much of the money that the Prime Minister pledged in return for an acceptable withdrawal agreement. And it's going to deliver us all the certainty and continuity all sectors of the economy need on terms which completely suit us. Well, stop me if you've heard this one before, but I gather that the EU27 will be so desperate when we finally walk away from the table that they'll be running after us for a new preferential deal and junking all those tedious preconditions they've spent the last two years agreeing unanimously. So how do you achieve this incredible feat of prestidigitation given that the WTO prescribes that any preferential deal has to cover substantially all trade and therefore rules out sectoral mini-deals, which is why cake-eating partial single market, partial customs union deals could never fly, as indeed we were explaining to ministers every week well before I resigned. How do you get out of this? You invoke Article 24 of the WTO to argue that you can jump out to WTO terms, but then have up to a 10-year interim period in which you do not have to impose, reimpose tariffs across the channel, which would, of course, wipe out sizable chunks of the UK food industry, for example, you don't have to do it because you're in the process of negotiating an FTA. Just one slight problem with that argument, it's a willful and awful misinterpretation of what Article 24 of WTO actually says, as those dreaded trade experts keep on pointing out. But in common with other such claims, despite being rebutted as nonsense by people who actually understand WTO rules, the claim is never retracted. It also takes two to negotiate an FTA. And in circumstances where the UK has walked away from the withdrawal agreement, is refusing any agreement with a backstop in it, 
and saying that money it has previously agreed to pay is now withheld until any final trade deal is reached. I'm not making this stuff up. It's all there from the last two Brexit secretaries on the record within the last two weeks. Uh, it won't be difficult at all for the EU to adopt a common position in reaction to that, I can tell you. And nor will the EU, in the event of a no deal, share the latest Brexiteer fantasies that all we need to do is flout the WTO's so-called most favoured nation principle and carry on according each other trade preferences across the channel and refusing to levy tariffs as if nothing had changed. I mean, it's really bizarre listening to this stuff coming from British politicians, self-styled defenders of the liberal international order suggesting this nonsense. Under WTO law, you simply can't do that. And non-reciprocal preferential trade, we just do it ourselves, is simply illegal, so we can't do it either. But let's be honest, and to return to what I said earlier, no deal has become the latest canvas, really, for Brexiteer dreams. None of this really actually has to be true. It just has to sound compelling and reassuring to people. When we're assured by the former Foreign Secretary that, and I quote, ample, balanced, and pragmatic mini-deals will be prepared in a jiffy once we've just said no to the current deal, he knows full well it isn't true. It's just a pale repetition of the same old, tired, rhetorical tropes we heard from him in office in 2016-17-80. And that EU common position, which will be very easy to strike, believe you me, post a collapse of the withdrawal agreement, will not be them begging us for the immediate start of free trade agreement talks. It will be a calm repetition that there is a readiness on their part to open free trade agreement talks the moment the UK makes good on its promises on the backstop and on money. Coupled with a whole set of unilaterally decided measures, unilaterally at the 27th, to assure continuity where the EU most requires it. Of course there won't be a complete termination of trade and investment fl flows or of every flight that goes from the UK to the continent. But what there would be, already exists, is shelves of legislation, EU level and national, to deliver continuity where it most matters to the 27, and to deliver, I hope, public safety and health here, but to deliver enough serious con discontinuity and pain where it matters to force the UK back to the negotiating table to agree the same or worse terms. But to move to the opponents and the proponents of reversing the revolution, before the mandate from the referendum has even expired or been fulfilled, they are, I'm afraid, now likewise utterly determined not to compromise. That's the nature, I think, of the British political debate at the moment. The guns of the people's voters are therefore trained on all softer versions of Brexit involving close and deep relations with the EU from outside it. Nothing is worse for the people's vote lobby than either the Norway Plus proposals, which have been running a bit on both sides of the House in the last few months, or the kind of association agreement type models advanced actually by federalists like Andrew Duff who accept the fact of Brexit and want to find pragmatic solutions for a post-Brexit relationship which might work and might keep the post-Brexit relationship deep, amicable and robust. Because the People's Vote Lobby think that if they can eliminate all softer Brexit options from the field, they would face a straight fight with the Prime Minister's deal, which the avid Brexiteers will have helped them discredit and demolish. But this, we have to be honest, means that if they don't succeed in stopping Brexit in the next few weeks via a new referendum, they will have spent much of the last year attacking the type of post-Brexit relationship which they will then want to advocate in the next two years as the post-exit trade negotiations get underway. Unless the only option they can support after exit, that is, is a campaign for immediate reaccession to the EU using Article 49, in which case... I rather fear we're seeing a mirror image of the Brexiteer strategy for the 20 years before the referendum, a sort of masochistic hope that things go as badly as possible for the country. But I also fear, I see in the incipient campaign to stay in a reformed Europe, many of the British exceptionalist delusions which have run through pro-European Union circles, at least since Maastricht in this country. The key reason David Cameron shifted over time from his Bloomberg vision the Bloomberg speech vision of January 2013 of pan-European reform and flexibility, the blueprint for the whole of Europe, to a narrower focus on entrenching key bits of a sui generis, unique British deal was, he once put it to me, direct. Most of these people, he said to me, my fellow leaders, that is, they don't really agree with me on much of that. 
And with the highly ironic, certainly in today's circumstances, exception of trade liberalisation, on which actually they did largely agree with him and on which the British have view has largely prevailed in the European Union, and the same applies actually, ironically, of course, to single market liberalisation within the EU, he was largely right on that. They didn't really agree with him. And pro-European campaigners at the moment are not facing up to the reality of where we stood in the European Union and how unique our own conception of it was. Now, the proponents of middle-way Brexit options to the Prime Minister's proposal say, again with justice in my view, that the agreement she reached with the EU is purely a function of the preferences, the red lines she took into the negotiation, and that hers isn't actually a soft Brexit at all. It's clearly a hard Brexit, which ultimately involves leaving both the single market and the customs union, and thus guaranteeing that there will be less trade and on worse terms with the EU than their own alternatives, be that a permanent customs union, which is essentially the Jeremy Corbyn position, or a European economic area-based deal, the Norway Plus customs union proposition that Nick Bowles and others have been propagating in recent weeks. So they say she's just postponing elements of that transition. She's offering false temporary comfort to regulated goods sectors, the ones I referred to earlier. They'll still face a shock further down the line when she does leave the customs union. And, no, and then she's offering no comfort at all to those sectors hit worst by the unequivocal decision to leave the single market. And on that, of course, Monsieur Barnier and EU leaders back them up. Because they've said incessantly that were the Prime Minister to exhibit flexibility on her red lines, different, by which they mean economically preferable for the UK, uh, economic and trade deals would be doable. In other words, it's the Prime Minister's own preferences which are constraining the level of trade preferences and market access on offer to us after Brexit. Well, they would say that uh, on the European side, of course. It's your choice and you must finally decide what you want has been the EU's negotiating stance throughout. But it's essentially accurate, and the Prime Minister has herself, after all, publicly accepted that her own positions on the need completely to end free movement of people, which is a very cardinal thing for the Prime Minister, she wants to end free movement of people, and to escape the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, mean that we shall leave the single market. What we all know after the last two and a half years, or you know, anybody who doesn't know hasn't been listening, but more importantly, the EU knows it too, is that the single most important objective for the Prime Minister, which has dictated where her ZOPA was, has been ending free movement of people and having complete national control over which Europeans and not just non-Europeans ever get the right to settle in the UK. Now, the Prime Minister, after months of, in my view, completely pointless effort, trying for models of post-Brexit services trade, which it was obvious the EU would never agree for a third country which did not want a European economic area type deal involving free movement, she had, by the time of the Chequers proposal, uh, decided that the game was up. So she put the needs of goods sectors, and notably EU-regulated manufactured goods sectors, much higher up and accorded them greater importance than the needs of service sectors. And this has, frankly, rather bemused EU elites with whom she negotiates, because they're used to a British political elite who they think basically correctly have never really thought about the EU in anything, anything other than purely economic and mercantile terms. And suddenly you're dealing with a UK elite which seems not to be deriving its negotiating positions anymore from any analysis you recognise or remember of the UK's vital national interests. And that's really what's led us to this very bizarre customs union debate of the last uh, couple of years. Bizarre because it's important, the customs union, but it's not the most important thing. And yet we've obsessed far more about trading goods and the customs union than we have about anything else. Now, why? The Prime Minister came under very strong pressure from key successful manufactured goods sectors, autos, pharmaceuticals, aviation, chemicals, many others, all of whom told her that their commitment to remaining heavily present in the UK depended on perpetuating a business model constructed on the basis of customs union membership and adherence to harmonised single market rules in their sectors. All of these sectors are mass exporters to the EU, all currently operate under EU-level regulatory frameworks. We don't have UK-level regulatory frameworks. We're going to have to develop them if that's where we want to go. None has an appetite for regulatory divergence from the EU. It's clearly senseless for them as to market their goods on the EU market. They will, post-Brexit, have to demonstrate compliance with precisely the same rules and standards. National sovereignty in these sectors for them is really purely notional. And in a world of trade blocks, the EU, US, China, perhaps Japan, but 
those three other big ones, which set and impose extraterritorially, outside their own boundaries, their own standards. An autonomous UK is not a big enough market to become a global standard setter. So this put the Prime Minister in an extraordinarily difficult position. She knew that the right of her party and the primary enthusiasts for Brexit in it attached huge importance to having a fully autonomous and sovereign trade policy and were completely determined to leave the customs union and abandon the common external tariff of the EU27. And she promised them, we'll leave the customs union. She simultaneously promised Dublin that somehow or other, the move to a completely different trade and regulatory regime and different tariffs, plus all the other issues like rules of origin and anti-dumping provisions, that, don't worry, that will never necessitate the erection of a hard border across the island of Ireland because I'm against that. And then, when after the election, finding she was in a weaker position rather than a stronger one, she promised the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, on whose vote she depends for her, the government's survival, that she would not permit customs and regulatory divergence between Northern Ireland uh, and the rest of Great Britain, which the Democratic Unionists would regard as a major step uh, on the slippery slope to Irish unification. Now, the fact is that these three promises are manifestly not all deliverable at once. One can deliver any two of those three, but self-evidently not the third, as they're mutually contradictory. It wasn't one of the more popular things I ever said, that they're mutually contradictory, but they are. Um, and that's, I think, uh, commonly recognised now. That led Dublin, rather understandably, to think that unless it secured legal guarantees that regardless of whichever trade deal the UK ended up with with the EU, there would be no hard border, it would find its own interests subordinated to the other two commitments and a hard border would be the inevitable result. And the more it heard from both the Prime Minister and from the right-wing opponents of the Prime Minister, the more it had this view confirmed because the only trade agreement these people would ever do with the EU would, as Dublin saw it, clearly guarantee the need for a hard border. And so they pushed hard and successfully, this is much resented by the British political class, but the Irish were extremely successful in pushing it, for agreement on a backstop provision in the December 2017 agreement. And when that got translated, as was agreed and inevitable, into a legal text, for incorporation into the withdrawal agreement, the Prime Minister reacted, as we all saw, quite violently against it and said no Prime Minister could ever sign up to a backstop that looked like that. And the only way the Prime Minister thought, once she saw that text, that she could render it remotely palatable to the Democratic Unionists was by promising it would never come into force. And therefore, by turning the backstop into an all-UK backstop, which would remain in force unless and until a different solution was found to avoid the need for a hard border. But that very commitment to an all-UK backstop solution, for which I think there was no escape from December 2017, I have to say, you know, I've been saying to the private sector since December 2017, I don't see how this thing passes the House of Commons, and I think there's a much more severe risk of no deal than you all understand. But that very commitment to an all-UK backstop solution, which must have felt for the Prime Minister like a breakthrough to a deal which the EU had, after all, previously said it wouldn't do as part of the Article 50 process, that didn't actually enhance her prospects of getting the withdrawal agreement through the House. If anything, it, it made matters considerably worse. For the right, an all-UK backstop with no unilateral way in which to exit it risked condemning the UK in perpetuity to a closer economic relationship with the EU than they wanted to have and depriving the UK of the ability to run a fully autonomous trade policy if, even after the end of the period of so-called vassal state transition. So it seemed to them to be heading inexorably to precisely the same policy as that of the leader of the opposition, a permanent customs union. So the last several weeks, if not months, have been dominated by the Prime Minister seeking political and ideally further legal assurances that the all-UK backstop, which, to repeat, she herself deliberately sought as the centrepiece of the withdrawal agreement, not simply a political aspiration for the accompanying political declaration, that that is not intended to lock us in perpetuity into an arrangement which precludes us ever assuming full sovereignty over trade policy in goods as well as services. Now, those political assurances were forthcoming in the exchange of letters between the Prime Minister and the Presidents of the Commission and the Council the day before the meaningful vote. But as we saw, they made absolutely no difference to the devastating scale of her defeat. And although I believe the EU side is genuine, and I do believe that, in not wanting either an all-UK or an Ireland-specific backstop to be in place for the long term. The reality is that the backstop 
would come into and would remain in force unless and until it's replaced by some other arrangement which makes it unnecessary to erect a hard border. And on here, I'm afraid we remain firmly in the world of make-believe and fantasies. The Prime Minister still talks as if the need for the backstop will automatically melt away the moment a full trade deal is struck. And that therefore all that matters for her to get now really is cast iron commitments from the other side to expedite and complete a free trade agreement. But this is manifestly untrue unless the free trade deal were such as to render the backstop otios. And that's not the sort of trade deal to which she actually aspires. To her right, we have Brexiteers arguing that we should be able to use administrative measures and technology to solve the Irish border issue without the need for a backstop at all. You get this endlessly from the European Research Group, but also others like you know, Peter Lilly, uh, John Redwood, and all the rest, and seemingly believe that there can be some sort of bilateral agreement between the UK and Ireland which takes the backstop completely off the table. Total fantasy world. There's no way that the Irish will agree that. But administrative measures can never do more than reduce, than reduce border frictions. They never eliminate them, and they haven't done so, even at borders like the Norway-Sweden border, which by definition is a border between an EU member and a European Economic Area member, who are therefore much more closely integrated than hard Brexit advocates ever want the UK to be with the EU. Uh, and therefore that border, the Norway-Sweden border, requires fewer administrative measures than an Irish border would if we conclude any trade deal of the type that they want. Again, if you want less integration with the EU economy, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to argue for. But then don't tell us that there'll be friction-free trade and seamless borders, because there can't be, and there won't be. And technology, as yet unavailable technology, incidentally, even when it does exist, can address only the customs issues. A plethora of other border <coughs> checks necessitated legally by having different regulatory regimes and enforcement machinery once we leave the single market are never going to be solved by technology. A border is not simply about checks on customs and people. And so it's even more disingenuous, frankly I would say dishonest to say, as again the hard Brexiteers do, that after resolving the Irish border issue via administrative measures and technology, the whole UK would be able to enter into a Canada-style free trade agreement of the type, they say, suggested by Donald Tusk. The reality is that Donald Tusk made no such proposal. He said that a Canada-style agreement could be offered to Great Britain only. Great Britain, not Northern Ireland. But that to obviate the need for a hard border that the Prime Minister had committed to avoid, Northern Ireland would, if the UK chose, which was its sovereign right, to go for a Canadian-type option, Northern Ireland would re need to remain in a much closer economic relationship, entailing, of course, the customs border in the Irish Sea, which the UK government rejects as a threat to the integrity of the Union, perfectly understandably. So Tusk actually said any deal, Canadian or closer, was necessarily dependent on the UK signing the withdrawal agreement with the backstop in it. So this is, in other words, let's be clear, almost the exact opposite of what the former two former Brexit secretaries and the former Foreign Secretary at Ledge has already been offered to the UK. To be completely clear, no deal along the lines touted as already having been offered to us, to the UK, has been or ever will be. A Canada-style deal, which looks very different from the proposition they espouse, and is, in my view, seriously bad for the economy, could be offered to Great Britain only. But the very thinness of that free trade agreement, which I described earlier, entails guarantees that radically different arrangements would have to be agreed for Northern Ireland, and so you haven't escaped the entire nexus of the... You don't escape the backstop issue simply by wishing it away, let alone by fantasising about bilateral deals with Dublin, when the policy competence for customs issues resides on the other side of the negotiating table at the EU level anyway. So after uh, this uh, long and gloomy exposition, uh, one, I'm sure you'll be in need of a stiff drink, and two, uh, you'll be asking, so given that we've actually arrived here, what on earth should we do now to get out of this hole? Um, now, before Christmas, in a lecture I gave in Liverpool, I suggested nine lessons that might usefully be applied to the situation that I think we'll face for the next few years. We were told yesterday the Prime Minister has in the last several weeks since reaching agreement with her EU colleagues but not coming close to the persuading the House that it's the right agreement has learned six lessons. Well, whether she's learned any of the right lessons, time rolls on and Plan B evidently bears a, an uncanny resemblance to Plan A. 
Um, so let me conclude my rather less snappy uh, animadversions tonight by distilling just a few lessons from what I've said tonight. Uh, and I've gone for these four. Um, firstly, Article 50 can, for all its oddities, and there are quite a lot of oddities in it in my view, probably work as an exit route for leaving the European Union. And let's be honest, as Democrats, countries do have to be able to exit the European Union if that's their democratic choice. If the UK can't manage it, and we're the size of the two-thirds of the smallest member states put together, there really is a huge problem. But Article 50 only works if the exiting country has worked out where it's exiting to. <laughs> and is very clear-sighted and basically united about what it wants to gain and what it's prepared to lose. And neither of those things applies in the UK. At the moment, we still have a political class determined not to look reality in the eye. <coughs> They'll only, in my view, damage their reputation with the public further over the next several years if they continue to fail to. And we have very little unity, rather less probably than we had 30 months ago, with growing risks both to social and national cohesion. Indeed, with a growing risk that the UK will, in the next decade, break up. We need a political discourse that recognises there's no single perfect answer. There never was a single perfect answer inside the EU or outside the EU. Not a discourse in which all sides are now playing the everything bar my own version of reality as a humiliation, a betrayal, or a complete disaster. And we need a political process which enables the public actually to see the choices, or we shall have made, or we shall have many very bitter years ahead in which we'll only really hear from the losers as trade deals and other things are concluded. And huge trade offs are coming, and those trade offs need to be explained properly to the public so that they see what they are and what decisions have been made and why. Second lesson we have to actually understand how the EU works and negotiates because we shall, like it or not, not be floating free of ties and responsibilities in the mid Atlantic. We shall, like an outsized Switzerland, be negotiating on everything from fish to financial services, from food and farming to fundamental rights, and that's just the Fs, for as long as both the UK and the EU exist. There's no leap to freedom which permanently ends this. It's just exactly what intensity of relationships one wants and why one wants those that needs deciding. It doesn't pay to be starry-eyed or naive in negotiating with the EU machine, and for all the belligerent talk and now the fist-waving no-deal rhetoric, senior ministers have been both, and they've been rolled over repeatedly in the last uh, two years. The EU is a difficult negotiating partner. I say this as somebody who's worked within it and, and outside, outside it. It's treated this process as essentially a technocratic process of de-accession, I would call it. In other words, the reverse of the process of accession when you join the European Union. Now, that style works on accessions because it's basically an inevitable grinding process of convergence on a known destination, and the known destination is the voluminous EU law book. And the EU then dictates the entire game and exhibits quite a lot of strategic patience. But we are heading to an unknown destination and a contested destination. And the EU style of negotiating is inflexible. And in this negotiation, technocratic overreach in the departure of a major member state may still end badly. And the EU side at leader level, I think, has to think harder about why this is happening and why we're in this mess and about where it's going with the UK in the longer term. It needs to think strategically. Repeatedly saying, as the EU side has, and we never get anything coherent from you in London, even if that's very often true, is not really enough. Third, the baselines in any negotiation, where you start from, matter. We started this one in a way, in my view, calculated to land us exactly where we've landed. I've explained on the impending trade negotiations, assuming we ever get there, why we would profoundly not want to start from a WTO-only baseline and why the current withdrawal agreement already tilts the playing field very nicely in the EU's direction for the talks to come. And to revert to that Canadian example I gave, demonstrating why a Canada-type deal gives services companies so much worse terms than the ones they currently have, it's precisely this discussion and negotiation to try and winnow down the length of lists of exemptions and carve-outs and national discriminatory rules that takes the time. Only ministers and ex-ministers who've never personally got anywhere near a trade negotiation, let alone conducted one, think that this can be quick and easy. If you start from the baseline of being a bog-standard third country with no preferences, others will ensure 
you pay a heavy price within and beyond that sector for every step you take back towards the world you used to inhabit. And the fact is that everything is and has to be connected. And that's one reason why, another reason why these sort of no-deal, maxi, multi, mini-deals or whatever the latest fiction is called won't work. No one on the other side of the channel is going to sign off now on what they, the UK most urgently wants until they've banked an awful lot of what the UK doesn't want. I'm sorry if that sounds rough, but others have interests in politics too. And it's time that we had a grown-up debate about others having interests in politics too. And if we end up seeking, as we might, for political reasons, a quick and dirty trade deal to be done at all costs before the next UK general election, unless that UK general election is in the next few weeks, and we want to escape the vassaldom of transition, the EU will use the pressure of the ticking clock in the next phase just as effectively as they have in this phase to extract concessions on the substance, because that's what they'll do. Fourth, and finally, one can't rule out in the current chaotic circumstances an extension of Article 50, whether a technical short one, because we're too short of time to get the legislation through the House in good order, or a longer one, because the whole thing remains such a total mess, and both sides at top political level conclude that a disorderly and bitter no-deal at this point is better avoided. So you can't rule it out. And on, one can well see on that kind of issue that leaders might have a rather different perception from technocrats and come out at a different place. Although, by and large, actually, contrary to what UK politicians have expected, by and large, at every stage so far, leaders have been rather less inclined to be flexible than Brussels apparatchiks. But an extension of Article 50 is not a given, and it's not a UK decision. I still encounter a lot of scepticism in other capitals about whether it serves much purpose. If all it does is to license a prolongation of the same, so, same old self-absorbed British debate which, as I've said, seems to specialise at the moment in outrage about what we absolutely cannot tolerate, but to be terribly short of proposals about what we could live with post-Brexit, which have any chance whatever of actually being agreed, and of the UK side actually wanting to adhere to them for more than a few months after it's left. So extra time in a negotiation is only of any real value if you make use of it to progress and change the national debate. And there are no signs, really, at the moment of a progression and change in the national debate. Now, I've said today, as I said before Christmas, that it's time to wake up. I've said today, perhaps more clearly, that it's not just one side of the debate which seems to be lost in its own dreams. I understand why each of the alternative versions of reality is more attractive to those who wish to live there than the real world that I'm afraid I see. And I know that the reality as I've understood it and lived it for many years in the kind of uh, dark grey rooms of Brussels and other capitals, with many companions in Whitehall who work so hard on behalf of the public and politicians and governments. I know that reality is cold and boring and prosaic and peopled by desiccated grey-suited technocrats who can always come up with some tedious reason why you can't have all you want all of the time. Uh, I think that's part of the job of some uh, technocrats. Now, i I know that those who kindly you know, cheered my remarks and comments over recent months and the last couple of years have been buoyed by the hope that I might be helping puncture those dreams peddled by their opponents and by the thought that they could sort of discern some lurking poetry in the dead hand of my bureaucrat prose. But I'm afraid of what I can't do is to do more than I try and do for our lectures like this. I'm able to throw a bucket of cold water on those who sleep on and on in the hope that finally they wake up and notice where they are and that the fire could consume them. But that's all I can do. Thanks. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was a tour of the force. We're now going to uh, open this to questions. Uh